Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this worship on the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. One of the things we do during the Epiphany season is focus on uh, the uh, credibility of Christ as the Messiah. And so uh, what we'll be looking at today is how then that plays out in uh, our lives as Christians. Because on the one hand, it is true that there is one true God and uh, that Jesus Christ is both God and Lord. However, how we live that out and how we approach other people with that uh, can uh, have a very different impact depending upon how we go about it. And that's the focus of the service today. Uh, the schedule is pretty standard. Bible class on Wednesday, gals meet on Saturday, and then we'll have Bible class and worship next Sunday. After church today, the gals are hosting a taco bar type of uh, dinner, and so you'll stay for that. Uh, otherwise, the, uh, the sermon title is Learning to Love, and, and uh, how do we take the fact that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and deal with the world around us uh, as Christians with regard to it. So that is the focus of today's service and our theme. So with that, we begin with the opening hymn, Thy Strong Word.
us as we turn to page 203 in the fourth part of the hymnal and begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Both you that are forgiven, if there were your fear. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only begotten Son to die for each and every one of you and forgives you all of your sins. As I called an ordained servant of that same Christ, and by his authority I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Blessed is the one <coughs> whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord commit, counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely, in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord.
Hallelujah. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany is from Deuteronomy chapter 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and it is also the sermon text. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, though former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their consciences, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as we sing together the Alleluia verse. Thank mm -hmm. you.
the first chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Together we confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page 206. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of the sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So our sermon talks about learning to love, and it's from the First Corinthians text read earlier. How many of you know someone who has an altar to their ancestors where they pray and burn incense? How many of you know someone who has a statue of the Hindu god Ganesha? Uh, there was a time where knowing such people might have been quite rare in many parts of the United States. Yet especially in urban areas, East Asian and Indian populations have maintained vibrant communities that enjoy our religious freedoms. I bet you do know someone who spends a lot of time online. Maybe they feel more like they are an important part of the group when they interact with friends on social media and chat. Maybe online multiplayer games make someone feel more alive than the daily grind. Maybe one feels that the new vistas revealed by online documentaries and other content open up life and make it more exciting. It can be easy to want to live in that part of life, yet we live in a world where we have to work, eat, and do all the boring stuff because we have to survive. What I've been talking about here is cases of what some people call gross and fine idolatry. Gross idolatry is when you have a literal object that focuses worship and devotion to a god. Fine idolatry is when something takes up so much of your attention and effort that it effectively becomes the governing principle in your life. 
Of course, the word idolatry is based, is biased because it assumes that the idol is not a true God, as we read in 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 6. So how do you engage a person who is different from you or who has drifted off into another world, another path in life? You have knowledge to be sure you can tell such people what you know to be true, but what will be the outcome? Our text speaks about food offered as a sacrifice in various Greek temples. These temples would share part of that sacrifice with worshipers, either on site or potentially allowing them to take uh, you know, a doggy bag home or something like that. They would, they would eat it in the temple or they would take it home and they would invite their friends to do so as part of their social circle. And uh, that would be a sign of their particular God's benevolence. Some Christians in Corinth, and likely other places in the Roman world as well, would have no problem in being invited to their non-Christian friend's house or to the whatever temple that they worshipped at to eat with them because they were very comfortable with the idea that Christians know that there is only one God and Lord, and that is an objective fact to which nature itself attests. You know, however much modern atheists try to disprove God as a fiction, such as like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Michael Shermer and others, they uh, have to take scripture out of context, really, to, to do so. Yet, Raymond Littleton, fellow of the Royal Society, observed worse and worse data coming into the scientific literature since the 1970s, and this was the result of playing politics with science. So I think we can be comfortable that, in fact, there is one true God. And that's what the Epiphany season really is about, attesting to the divinity of Jesus Christ. Psalm 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. There's no surprise that Jesus had a star appear at his birth. Your homework will not do itself, folks. Your bed will not make itself. You should not be surprised that information does not create itself. And the laws of nature depend explicitly on the transition and movement of information. Thus, belief in God is both rational and necessary. Even, you know, secularists believe in God, they just believe in a different one. Yet, uh, some other people were not so comfortable with Christians going to eat sacrificial meat in the houses or temples of unbelievers. They, they saw this as giving the idols the respect that they should not have. They saw this as hypocrisy. They started to wonder if the whole gospel message about Christ might be just yet another uh, religion among many, and they started to lose faith. And that is a serious problem. Paul addressed this problem by agreeing that some statue is nothing more than a stone statue. In the same way, a Ouija board is just an object, right? It's just a piece of cardboard and a movable game piece. But objects, however mundane, can actually lead people astray in some pretty bad ways. If eating sacrificed meat causes a believer to question the legitimacy of Jesus and his love, and if that causes the person to consider the idol as a possible way to believe, then instead of looking down on such believers, those who are stronger in the faith should not go the way of knowledge, but rather the way of love. The Bible gives us a very some very great examples in Ezekiel with regard to this. In Ezekiel 28, the Lord says, as a fact that the king of Tyre is exceedingly wise, more so even than Daniel, because of such wisdom, that king has become so arrogant 
that he has made himself to be his own God, even though he is not. There is the root of his downfall. And we can see that in human society today amongst sort of the elite class among us. Do they think of themselves as their own gods? Probably. Also, in Ezekiel 28, we see an image of Lucifer before the fall of Adam and Eve into sin. Lucifer was beautiful and precious, the guardian cherub of the holy mountain of God. The cherubim are God's heralds, his mighty servants, whose voices shake creation. Cherubim fill people with awe, wonder, and even terror. This great caretaker, Lucifer, went the way of knowledge and scorned all love because he could not stand the idea of caring for humans for whom the Lord God, the person of Christ, was fully willing to die in order to save them. Knowledge puffs up, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. But pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, verse 18. If we have knowledge from God, we have it as a gift to use in a loving way. Even the people who annoy us are loved because Christ died also for them. That is the same, that is the, the game changer here. Uh, Luther, uh, <clears throat> Lucifer could not handle the fact that God so loved these humans that he created that he would send his only son to die for them and save them, John 3, 16. Lucifer fell and became the adversary, Hasatan in Hebrew, whom we usually refer to as Satan, the one who sets himself up against God and against mankind. There are so many ancient religions that have powerful figures who oppose the gods. Greeks had Titans versus Olympians. The Norse had the Jotun, the so-called giants or anti-gods, against the Aesir, the legitimate gods. Zoroaster and others also had similar ideas. It seems likely that people who had turned away from belief in Yahweh, the one true God at some point, still took with them some very old knowledge. Even after they changed the stories about the gods, a ghost of the old knowledge remained. After all, we see that alone or together, life is full of sorrow, and then we die, whether we want it or not. On that point, all human beings agree. But the fact that Christ died for you and for me changes everything. The idea that God would die for you, no one else, no other religion has that. We all see the relentless work of God's law every day. The soul that sins shall die. Ezekiel 18, verses 4 and 20. Only the Holy Spirit can open our eyes, heart, and mind to receive the gospel. Indeed, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, <clears throat> yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. John 11, verses 25 and 26. That statement will give you goosebumps. It offers a new vista, a real one that is better than the death spiral of this life. It's better than any online game. It's better than any social media. It's better than any statue or pagan altar. Salvation is free for you how can you not get excited even more than for some online game or stone statue? And if your own knowledge of things starts to make that weaker brother or sister seem annoying, come back to your baptism 
where that new vista opened up for you. Come back to the words of the Lord that his gospel might fill you again with excitement and possibilities. Come back and be loved once again by Jesus, your Savior. Then you will remember again what it means to be loved. Then you will know again how you can love others. That includes Christians who are weak in faith, people of another faith, or people who have become consumed with earthly things as their masters. How do you engage them? The same way that Jesus engaged you. The gospel will not return empty. Isaiah 55, verse 11. And the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith, even unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God on earth in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We remember those who are in need of divine healing after medical procedures and uh, for various reasons who are uh, undergoing some kind of therapy, who are dealing with uh, poor health, who are wrestling with cancer, dealing with chronic pain. Uh, dealing with dementia and uh, suffering various other uh, health conditions that, that cause their lives to be troubling and uh, complicated. And Lord, we ask you to be with all who have been in hospital and uh, who are recovering and who are trying to, to make a good recovery. We ask you that if it be your will, Lord, give them complete healing according to your good mercy. And uh, send your Holy Spirit to comfort them in their, their time of trial, that they might not lose hope. But as it is your intent to build us up, Lord, we ask you to edify them through all means possible, that they continue to be strong in faith and persevere unto the end, when they shall receive the reward that you have prepared for them from the foundation of the world. Lord, in your mercy. We ask you to be with all who are in need of your divine guidance and protection, especially remember our military, our first responders, medical caregivers, those in authority, and those who are traveling at this time. We ask that you give those who need to make decisions the uh, guidance of your Holy Spirit, and that you send your holy angels to guard God and keep and protect all those who are in need of such protection. Lord, in your mercy. And our prayers. These and all other prayer requests, Lord, we set them before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> At this time, we'll collect the offer. We sing together the offertory, we give thee but thy honor. <laughs> Him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. 
because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, bless thee and keep thee. Lord, make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee his 